it's 2.30. There's been a ton of great content up until this point. And I'm uh, taking it all in and starting to feel a little bit lethargic. And so um, I'm going to do just a little bit of stretching. No one here is obligated to do that with me. But if you want to take part in this, you can all maybe like uh, stand up, get our hands up. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Oh, that feels good. Oh, yeah, I'm taking it down. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah, get a little to the side. Yeah, over here. Over there. Uh, get those arms out in front. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Yep, feel the burn. You did not see this coming, did you? <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you for indulging me in that. <laughs> Don't you all just feel so much better? <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So uh, today we're going to be talking about um, property-based testing and generative testing. And uh, this is actually not the talk that I uh, submitted, oh, nor was, it uh, was this the talk that was accepted. <laughs> but after uh, Dave's keynote yesterday, I was really inspired um, by the idea of thinking differently. We are in an incredibly early and fertile time in Elixir. Um, and I think it's really important to question the status quo, question the things that we've been doing. Um, and for me, property testing is that thing. That's the thing that is it's the thing that's hit me the most in, uh, in recent time. Um, as a way to think differently about a problem. So, I uh, was very happy that uh, after some drinks, I went up to John and I was like, please, can I give this other talk? And he said yes. So, uh, so here we are. Uh, side note, um, I also have these awesome Elixir stickers uh, with Elixir in a bottle, which is just really cool. So if you want one of those, come find me afterwards. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to discuss testing kind of as it is today. Uh, we're going to discuss property tests. We'll look at some basic examples of how to use those, and then we'll look at trying to model a real world application using properties. Uh, so let's kick it off. So testing. Who here believes testing is a really good idea? Who here tests? Uh -huh. I saw someone's hands start to go down. <laughs> I get it. Uh, testing, is, testing is interesting, it's also very challenging, and it takes time. Um, I think if you were to sort of map my career happiness uh, on a XY uh, graph like this, it might look something like this. Uh, down here in the early days, I, uh, I started out writing C for embedded systems, and I did not even know that testing was a thing. It took me getting into Java and learning uh, JUnit uh, to even discover that something like software testing was a real thing. And then I had the great uh, fortune of joining sort of the Ruby community, which is not a very <coughs> popular thing to say anymore in Elixir conferences, but uh, I actually uh, got a lot out of being in the Ruby community early on because we had these great testing tools built right into the language. That was really important for me. Uh, and so my happiness started to go up when I discovered TDD. I discovered that there was a way to write software tests. It was really cool. And that took me a, lo uh, a long ways into my career. Uh, until at some point I began to plateau, and I sort of refer to this as like the quiet contemplation phase, where I began to sort of question what it was that I was actually doing. And I wasn't getting the benefits from testing anymore that I used to get. And it led to this sort of period, uh, which I now call the trough of disillusionment, um, where I sort of fell into the camp of like, I don't really know why I'm doing this, I don't want to do this anymore, this isn't benefiting me uh, in the same way. And of course now, I'm all the way off to the side because I have discovered the joy of property tests. <laughs> as you will soon see. So it's really hard for me to talk about testing in my life without talking about TDD. The two things are really intertwined together. Um, and I'm gonna stop, in case you don't know what TDD is, I'm gonna stop using this acronym and I'll define what it is and say that TDD is test driven development. And the process is pretty straightforward in theory. Uh, you write a failing test. You write just enough code to make that test pass, and then you refactor. And you continue in this cycle over and over again. You add new features by writing a failing test for that feature, describing how you want that feature to, uh, you, you hide what you want that feature to do, the behavior of that feature. Um, and then you write enough, just enough code to make that test pass, and then you refactor. And also, in case um, anyone is feeling pedantic out there, which we're all programmers, so unfortunately those two things go hand in hand sometimes. 
Uh, I'm going to I'm using BDD here as well as an example. So like I use the terms BDD and TDD inter interchangeably. Um, it's not really important. Ideally, if you do this, you will gain some base uh, benefits. For instance, you'll get validation. You'll validate that your algorithm works in the way that you believe it should. You will get protection from aggression. You won't have as many bugs anymore. You won't ship broken code. And thirdly, and probably the most important, you will gain design. By allowing your laziness to sort of uh, uh, take over while you write a test, you'll make testing easy. And through that, you, all these good things will sort of shake out. You'll do things like dependency injection. You'll separate your concerns correctly. And a lot of people talk about this like, you know, tests provide mental guardrails. They provide this sort of easy road that you can take, and it keeps all the bad stuff uh, on your periphery. It's very important to note, though, that tests directly couple to your implementation. Every single one of them. Now that's like not necessarily a bad thing. We often want that in many ways, actually. We want to create a contract with the, our external APIs. The downside to this, though, is that uh, as soon as we change this API, even if we're only testing at the boundary, and even if we only change things internally, we'll still cause tests to fail. Because every one of these things is a couple. There is just isn't a way to write uh, example-based tests where this doesn't happen at some point. And so that kind of leads to a meme, uh, which is like, write as few tests as possible. And you might have heard some people talk about this. Um, so I want to try to illustrate some of these things. Um, and I want to do that using what I believe to be an incredibly contrived and straw man argument that will help me make my point. <laughs> And I'm telling you all this up front because I know it's a contrived and strongman argument, but I hope that what we can do is see past that a little bit and see into the truth of what we're trying to do here. Uh, and so, uh, that all being said, let's TDD addition. Everybody ready? I know, it's, it's 2.30 on a Friday, and this is the best thing we can be doing. Um, so, how do we do this? We start with a test, obviously. So we'll test that we can add two numbers together. Uh, we'll go ahead and write that. We'll say that we assert that adding 1 and 1 is 2, adding 0 and 2 is 2. That looks pretty good. And we'll go ahead and stub out that function call. Now, if we run this, sweet, we get a failing test. So what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? Well, again, let's remember, we should always write as little code as possible to make the test pass. So let's just return 2. Now we don't even need these pesky arguments. We'll just mark those as un, uh, unused, and we'll move on with our lives. And look, we have a green dot. We all love green dots. We shove this up onto uh, Heroku or wherever. We open up our new edition as a service. It's awesome. Uh, and everything's great. But wait. Three in the morning, the pager comes in. You get pinged. Hey. There's an issue with that add function. It doesn't seem to work with add three and four. What, we wrote tests. How do we have a problem here? Um, well, what do you do when you have a problem in production? You write a test for it, obviously, because you don't want to have that bug anymore, so we go write a test. We'll go ahead and say, well, assert that adding three and four is so. And now how are we going to solve this? Luckily, in Elixir, we have all the power of OTP. We have nets. And furthermore, we have pattern matching. So we are very equipped to go solve this problem. So we'll uh, just quickly inline this because uh, I just want to save space on the slide. And we'll go ahead and add a new clause. If we see a three, we'll return seven. And now we have green dots again. We rest easy. But wait, hey, I found an edge case with add. It looks like it doesn't work if you try to add negative values. Damn. This is really wrecking my weekend. So again, what do we do? We add a test. We'll go ahead and just 
pick something arbitrary, like add a negative one and four is equal to three. Run that, we'll get something that fails. That's good. And now we're ready to go ahead and solve this. And again, luckily, Elixir, it's one of the best languages I've ever used. We have this great thing called guard clauses. And we can use those guard clauses to go ahead and protect ourselves from these pesky nil or the negative values and return the right value. And now, if we run that, we'll get green dots again. Bonk the big green merge button, deploy it to production. That looks great. I think we finally found all the bugs. So, <laughs> I, I told you this was a contrived strawman argument to make my point, but I do think it's important to analyze what's going on here. Because at the end of the day, this is not actually that different from how we write code. And so, in order to kind of tease this apart, I think it's important to step back and say, what have we gained from this? Well, have we gained validation? Have we gained production progression with game design? Uh, starting with the top, have we gained validation? Absolutely not! We didn't even use the plus operator. Um, <laughs> there's no way uh, that we've actually validated this algorithm works. And so that's just right out the window. Uh, have we gained protection from regression? Well, I'm gonna give this like a half a slash. Because we have protected ourselves from regressions that we've thought about, or regressions that we've seen in production. But we haven't protected ourselves uh, in a, uh, from things that we can't see, from the sort of unknown unknowns problem. And how we gave design. Um, I actually think this is up for debate. Um, I personally still do a lot of TDD. The difference is now I throw the tests away when I'm done. Um, and I, I, do, I do think I gain some benefit from doing that. Others you know, have differing opinions. There's, for every research paper that says that uh, TDD is, in, is, is invaluable, there's uh, other papers that say that TDD is the only way to find bugs or whatever the case may be. Um, my opinions were probably just really bad at uh, writing papers about um, software practices, but you know, your mom is right there. Um, but I do think it's important, uh, going back to this metaphor, uh, this sort of these test providing guardrails idea. I think that's really cool. It's just that I don't know how efficient it is to drive down the highway smashing into the guardrail all the time, um, which is kind of unfortunately what tends to happen. An important thing to remember here is that there are bugs in your code. All of you. There are bugs out there in your code and they're latent. They're just waiting for three in the morning um, to pop up. And unfortunately, uh, there's no, it is an untenable problem to sit there and try to write enough tests to find out. You could be there until the heat death of the universe. And you, you know, you would, it'd be, if you want to spend your life doing that, that's fine. Um, it's not what I want to do necessarily. Uh, and beyond that, what about bugs that you can't easily write tests for, like a race condition? Like, especially in Elixir, where we're going to have uh, multiple processes all sort of working at the same time, we haven't fully eliminated race conditions. How are we going to write unit tests for that? How do you do that? So these are sort of the problems that I see uh, with testing and sort of example-based testing and TDD, as uh, I've been doing it at least for the past uh, several years. <laughs> and if that's the problem, obviously, I'm hoping to present a solution. And if you're all here at this talk, that solution is Property tests, or one of the solutions. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with property tests, uh, there's sort of, um, uh, 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 most everybody cites this paper as the, sort of the birth of this idea um, by John Hughes and Cohen Klassen uh, talking about quick check. And this was a tool written for Haskell in order to apply property testing, apply generative testing um, to algorithms and data structures. Uh, and since then, it's been ported to a ton of other languages, basically every language that matters uh, at this point. Um, in fact, John Hughes went on to write one for Erlang, uh, and it's now a licensed product, and it's probably the best quick check implementation now for, for Erlang. Um, uh, there's even one, I mean, Crawford wrote one for JavaScript. I haven't used it, but if Crawford wrote it, I assume it is one of the good parts. So. <laughs> Um, but the idea is that we're going to, uh, the, the, kind of the thing that they fixated on in this is that uh, typically with example-based tests we have something like this. 
We have an expected value and we have an actual value, and we compare those two things. And you could basically boil down every test that you write to something like this. And then the problem with this, though, is that it's incredibly overly specific. If you know the output that you want to have, uh, then you can't possibly um, interact with all the other possible input uh, data that you could have. So, for instance, if we had like a distribution like this, you would pick a couple points on it. This doesn't actually completely satisfy all the uh, all of the different uh, pieces of data that you could input into your algorithm. And so, instead of this, what we really want to do is kind of draw a box around all of this and say, well, it kind of fits into here. So, what we'll do is we'll start by just generating data. In this case, we're going to generate integers. This could be really whatever you want. We're going to pass that into some function, some property, and then we're going to look at the output. And we're going to make some decisions based on the output. And this thing in the middle, you'll also hear me refer to this as an invariant. Um, so it's important to define what an invariant is. Uh, an invariant is a function quantity or property that remains unchanged when a specified transformation is applied. Uh, in this case, you can kind of think about an invariant or a property as a law, a law that your algorithm has to conform to. So with all of that sort of head knowledge, let's look at how we apply this. So the first thing we want to do, if we want to go back to our original example, is we have to ask ourselves this question. What is true about addition? What is true about addition? <laughs> this, is, this is really hard. And this is actually where property testing becomes incredibly difficult. Because you have to stop and reason very deeply about the algorithm that you're testing. Um, and so if you're like me and it's addition, you go look it up in Wikipedia for this talk. Um, but, you know, or you can, you know, if it's data structure, you might be able to look at the rules of that data structure. Uh, but we need to figure out what those properties are. And this can be very challenging. But if you think about it for a while, you might remember um, that there's this interesting property about addition, which is if you add uh, zero to a value, you get the same value back out. And this is kind of, this is called the identity property. So let's write a test for that. So we'll start. Uh, same way we would normally allow our tests in our stub out function call here, and uh, then we're going to use QuickServe, thanks to Dave, um, uh, for um, uh, for our tests. And we're going to start use, uh, do that by saying ptest. And then we need a value. So we're going to generate an x value. And that x value would be an integer. And then finally, we can actually go ahead and write our assertion. We'll say, uh, if you add x and 0, uh, you should get x back out. If we run this, we should get a failure because we haven't implemented that yet. And we can now go back and implement it. Um, for, the sake of, uh, for the sake of learning, we'll go ahead and uh, take our same tactics we did when we uh, TDD'd this, and we'll go ahead and write the least amount of code possible to get this to pass. And so in this case, we're just going to return x. All right, so, and that will cause that uh, to pass. So now we need to think about more properties. We need to think about other things that help us define addition. And uh, again, if you think about it for a while, you may remember that there's a property called commutivity, which means that if I, I can add x plus y. And that's the same thing as saying y plus x. So let's write a property for that as well. In this case, we'll generate two different values, x and y. And we'll go ahead and add them in different orders. And we should get the same value. And now we should get a failure. And you can see what's happening here. Uh, we're actually seeing, it's actually showing you the values x is 0 and y is 1, and that will cause, uh, that will exercise a failure uh, for this algorithm, which makes sense if you look at our implementation. So we need to figure out a piece of code that will satisfy this test. <coughs> and the thing is, I kind of remember that multiplication is commutative. So let's try multiplying these numbers. So we'll multiply x and y, and we'll see what happens. <coughs> ah, it looks like we broke the first test, the identity test, because if you multiply by 0, you're going to get 0 back out. Again, Elixir is very cool, and we can pattern match on that case, and we'll, <laughs> add, uh, we'll add a guard there to look for 0, and then we'll just return x if that's the case. Uh, and then we'll run that, and we'll get that to pass. It's important to note at this point that uh, Neither one of those properties, even taken together, is enough to define what addition is. So we need more. And there's one other property, it's called associativity. It allows us, it means that we can add, a, like say, 1 plus x and then add y. And that's the same thing as adding, <coughs> uh, adding it to x. 
So let's write a property for that as well. Uh, again, we'll start off, we'll generate some values, x, y, and z, and then we'll add them in different orders, and now we should see a failure, which we do. Awesome. And you can see the values that it's outputting that it's trying, and, uh, and we'll, that, that will cause us to actually get a failure. And now, finally, taking together all three of these properties, we can do nothing but go back to our original implementation, no more shenanigans, and actually implement it using plus. Uh, and that's because at this point, we have defined the essence of what it means uh, to add something. Those three properties together. Any one of them alone isn't enough. And this is sort of a really powerful idea that you can describe sort of the base principle of something. Uh, with these different properties. It's very, very interesting. So now that we've gone through some of the basics, let's look at how we take this knowledge and apply it to a real application. So I wrote a little uh, Phoenix app. Um, it's a lunch motor. Uh, so you can go and say, oh, this is what I want to go get uh, for lunch today. It's all you know, using channels and whatnot. And I want to write property tests for this. So we start that by modeling the application. Again, going back to this diagram, we need to generate some values, we need to pass them to a property, and then we need to make a decision based on the output of them. And the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the input domain here? Like, what are the, value, what are the possible values that we can generate? We can think about, uh, we can derive that list of, uh, we can derive that input domain from our users. So if you think about a user, the way that they show up to your site, they'll arrive, and then they can choose to vote. And they can vote for the middle one, they can vote for the one on the left, and then they can vote for the one on the right. You can actually think about this in terms of a finite state machine. Right, so this might be a example finite state machine of a user. They start in the logged out state, they uh, transition to the logged in state, uh, via login, they can go back to the logout state, and then once they're logged in, they can also vote, in which case they'll stay in the logged in state. And so what we can do is, starting from a given state, we can generate transitions. So for instance, we might uh, generate a login, and then, we can, uh, and then we'll be in the logged in state. And then at that point, we can say, we can make an assertion. For instance, something like, did we actually get logged in? <coughs> Once they're there, we might generate another command, like a vote command. And at that point, we can also make another assertion, something like, you know, did the vote increase? And what we'll do is we'll uh, start generating just lists and lists of commands. So start with one, then another, and another, until we finally find one that fails. And then what will happen, using a technique called shrinking, the library will actually pick out, or help us pick out, the list of commands that will actually exercise a failure, and then return those to us. So what we'll be left with is a set of commands that you can run that will actually cause a failure to happen on your site or in your application. And that list of commands might look something like this. We might have two different users, and they might, you know, for instance, Chris might vote one, then two, Jane might then vote for one, and one, and three, uh, Chris might vote for two, and this might cause a failure. And at the end of it, what we'll get back out is a list like this which is much more useful. So how do we write this in, in, uh, in code? Well, Quixer uh, uh, um, uses uh, pollution to generate streams of data, and so we can kind of take advantage of that. So we'll just define a function called uh, gen commands for generate commands. It'll take a, a, a list of names. Uh, and then what do we want to return? Well, we want to return a list. We want to return a list of things to do. That list is going to uh, be a list of votes, and we're going to generate uh, 20 of them, because that's about all it's going to take to actually exercise a failure in this application. You can see we're actually calling into a second function there, gen vote, uh, and passing in the list of names, and we can define that as well. So gen vote is going to uh, be a tuple, and it's going to look like uh, a value a vote. Uh, it's going to choose from one of the names. And we're going to also choose one of our values, one, two, or three. And these are the, the different things you can vote for. And then once we've done that, we need to think of a property. So let's start simple and say something like, well, a user's vote should always increase. So let's write a property for that. 
we will start off with our standard test. Uh, we'll generate a list of commands. In this case, we'll pass in just a single, uh, single user. And uh, we'll go ahead and do a little bit of setting up the world since the votes are a, a global thing. We'll just need to reset that before the test starts. And then finally, we'll tell it to run commands. At the end, we'll get a result back out of it. And uh, we'll assert that the result is a true uh, or false one. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The implementation for run commands is incredibly straightforward. It takes the list of commands in the module and it just reduces overload, starting from some initial state. So for instance, uh, in this case, we'll start from zero and, uh, and true, and then we'll just run each command. And then the run command down here is not very interesting, actually. It just calls into the module uh, based on the state that it's at. So as I said, we, need, we can model everything as a state machine, so we need to define that state machine. Uh, so we'll do that. And we'll start by having a vote action. So this is something that, you, you know, that a user could do. And in this case, we're just posting to the API. Uh, but this could be anything you want it to be. It could be, you could actually, uh, uh, use a browser and test with uh, the actual browser, you can test the API, you can kind of test whatever level you want. This is just implementation detail and it's easier for the top. Uh, but you can see what's going to happen here is we're going to do a post, we'll get some new votes, and then we'll turn an OK and make it false. Uh, once that's done, we need a way to transition to the next state. So we'll have a vote next that we'll define. Um, and that will allow us to sort of say, this is the next state we should be in, and this is the value of that state after we're done transitioning. This is what it should be. And in this case, all we're going to do is go in and update the count for our name and the thing that we voted for. And then finally, we have a post, a uh, thing, you know, a way to like sort of uh, make an assertion. And this is this happens after we've transitioned. Um, in this case, we can actually get the real result, the actual result that came back, and compare it to our expected result. And it's nice because at this point we actually kind of get, get to get back to our expected versus actual, which tends to be easier to reason about. And so now uh, we're equipped to go ahead and run this test. And if we run that, you'll see it passes. Well, that's kind of boring. Um, so we should come up with some other properties for this. And I think another good one might be that users shouldn't affect each other's votes. So that would, that would be bad. Like you don't want to vote and then answer someone else's vote back. Uh, so we'll write that test as well. It's going to look very similar to the first. Uh, in this case, we're going to generate two different users, Chris and Jane. Uh, we'll reset our vote counter again, and then we'll go ahead and run our commands, and then we'll assert the result. So it looks very similar. The, the big difference, though, is that instead of running just commands this time, we're going to instead run parallel commands. And what that's going to do is it's going to uh, take the list of commands, it's going to split them, and then it's going to actually run both lists asynchronously. And this should be interesting. If we run that, you can see we'll actually get a failure. And you can see, so I, I added some debugging in here. This is the first uh, set of commands that it actually tried to run, and then this is what it shrank down to. And this is really interesting because it says that when Jane votes for one and when Chris votes for one, we don't get our expected results. And I just think this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> like, because I, I literally, I got this working uh, at one point, and I just giggled for like 15 minutes because it was so exciting. Um, because this means like we found a race condition. Like we found a bug without having to do, without having to look for that bug. Like that's awesome. That's so exciting. Uh, and of course, if we go and look at the code, you might be able to see uh, from this example where the actual bug is. Um, spoilers, I might have written this ahead of time so that it would definitely have a race condition in it. Um, uh, but what's happening here is that we're getting the votes out, we're updating and we're putting the votes back in. And that means it looks something like this, like if two different clients are talking to the vote counter, they both ask it for the count of votes, they both see a three, then they both update it, and then they both put that value back in and get four. And that's kind of like saying three plus one is plus one is four. Um, so we've lost somebody's vote in that. And this is easy to go fix at this point. We can just go and linearize uh, both of those rights, and we're okay. So with that, uh, I think it's important, again, to step back and look at what we've gained from this. So this is our list. This is what we wanted to get out of TDD. Well, did we get validation? Well, yes, because we've actually been able to describe the 
entire input domain. Now, it's not going to, not each test, each time you run the test, it's not going to run it with the, every possible value because that would, uh, that would be not tenable. Uh, but over time, you will run it with more and more random values and you will begin to find edge cases. And in fact, if you run this in something like a, like a continuous integration environment, it'll continue to find bugs for you. Um, we've got, because of that, we also gain protection from regression. Right? We can protect ourselves from the regressions that we found, and we can uh, protect ourselves from regressions that we haven't even discovered yet, that we haven't even thought about yet. And finally, did we get design? I, I would say that we have. Because by stopping and thinking about your users, and by thinking about the ways that they interact in your site, you are going through the same process that you would have with TV. You're thinking about the problem, which is the whole point. So, in conclusion, uh, I hope uh, in this talk we have seen how to think in properties. To, uh, we've been able to see how to model applications. Uh, we looked at uh, very easy ways of how to generate data, how to generate commands, uh, and then how to model users as finite state machines. Uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff, there's a ton of resources on it. Um, I, I totally recommend the original paper. It's a little dense, but it's, it's worth reading. Um, most of the state machine stuff all comes out of a paper uh, called uh, Finding Race Conditions in Erlang with Quick Check and Pulse, where they find a, uh, a race condition in deaths, I believe. Um, and a lot of that is taken from there, uh, the, other than the deterministic scheduler. Uh, but if you want to know more about that, talk to James in the back. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, there's a, great, there's a bunch of great talks out there as well, so go check all those things out. And uh, uh, finally, I, uh, I kind of want to leave you with a question, which is, if you could write less code and find more bugs, and if those tests that you write could continue to find more bugs, and you could continue to iterate quickly and provide value for your customers, would you do that? Thank you.